Hello everybody, and welcome back once again to Mountain Computers. Today, we're going to be taking a look at my dad's old Comtrade custom-built 486 PC. This was a machine that he built himself in the early 90s to my understanding, and the CMOS battery inside had leaked all over and of course is dead, but I wanted to try and restore the machine to functioning condition, so today, without further ado, let's take a look back back in time to a day when electrically computers were a little bit more simple but as far as user maintenance goes perhaps were a little bit more complicated so I'm gonna go ahead and perform some maintenance work on this PC get familiarized with it and then uh, we'll take a look at the hardware that's inside of it and some of the software that my dad had on it here we go <coughs> So kicking things off here, I just went ahead and took out the expansion cards in the drive bay. You can see the Intel 486DX processor chilling in there, as well as the Opti chipset and the 8 megabytes of system memory. There's the 3.5 inch 1.44 megabyte floppy drive, and there you can see my soldering iron heating up. There's the Western Digital Caviar 2200 hard disk. It's about a 200 megabyte drive. That's megabytes, yes. <laughs> and there's the ESA-based drive host card. It's got one prominently displayed IC there made by Winboard. And swinging around to the front of the case here, you can see the Comtrade logo. The motherboard is outfitted with uh, six ESA slots and one MDA slot. Plus there's one more at the top there that I couldn't identify. It might be an AGP slot, but I don't think so. And there's another look at the drive host card. It's responsible for connecting the hard disk and the two floppy drives, as well as giving the computer its two serial, one parallel, and one game controller ports. And there you can see the CMOS battery, and all the corrosion towards the top. These nickel cadmium cells are notorious for leaking all over motherboards and just destroying them. Luckily this board sits vertically and was able to avoid pretty much any uh, damage at all aside from two ICs whose legs look a little bit blue. So I just desoldered the battery from the board and decided I'd give the computer a test without the battery just to make sure everything else was still working correctly. Turns out it was, and aside from a uh, low CMOS battery warning, duh, the computer booted up just fine. So I ordered a replacement NICAD battery, probably a bad move, but I guess I'll take the risk on it leaking the same way it did before again in, you know, another 10 years. And here's the new battery soldered to the board. You can see some corrosion on the surrounding chips, but if I flip the board over, you can see all the connections still look good as new there, especially the battery, as, well, it is new. So from there I started the reassembly process, screwing the motherboard back into the case, getting the front panel I.O. back into place, screwing the drive bay back in, hooking the data connection back into the drives with these stupid IDE cables, hooking the motherboard power back in came after that. And then, with all that done, slotting the video card back into place. After that, I had to screw in the expansion card's brackets. And 
Then I set the case cover back on, slotted it in, and got to work screwing in all those screws that hold it on. So one more time, I'm gonna hook up the power um, and my back alley monitor and that AT keyboard and see if it turns on. Only this time I'm gonna hope that when I cycle the power off and back on again that all the settings hold. So it booted up fine. And here I am setting up the BIOS. This was a real pain before because I'd have to re-enter everything every time I'd turn the system power back on. And it required you entering all of your hard disk's info, like cylinders and headcount, so it got really annoying in a pretty short period of time. But after giving the system a power cycle this time, it looks like the battery's working like a charm and everything held. So let's take a look at exactly what's in the system. On the front you'll find some ventilation holes, the reset and turbo buttons, uh, the Comtrade logo, indicator lights for power, turbo, and hard drive activity. You'll also find the power switch, and the two 3.5 inch and two 5.25 inch bays. One of the 3.5 inch bays is occupied with a 2.88 megabyte floppy drive, and the 5.25 inch bay is filled with a 1.2 megabyte floppy drive. On the back, you'll find the VGA video card output, a 9-pin and a 25-pin serial port, and a 25-pin parallel port, and a 15-pin game controller port. Uh, in the left round-shaped hole, you'll find the AT-style keyboard input, and above that you'll find the power supply input and the pass-through output. Inside the case, at the bottom, you'll find the VGA graphics card, which is manufactured by S3, and above that the aforementioned drive controller host board uh, in its expansion bays. Then on the right you'll see the hard drive and the two floppy drives. You can also see that new CMOS battery on the top left of the motherboard. So I think we've just about covered all the hardware. Let's take a look at software. This is a custom boot menu that my dad programmed in BASIC. It'll take you to some of the most commonly used things on the computer. Uh, this is Windows 3.1 for work groups. You can see that QuickBooks and the After Dark Screensaver kit are um, installed as well as a few extra games. So back in DOS I found a few other interesting things, first of which is Tetris. I played that a few times and well I didn't do very well the first time but the the second time I killed it uh, compared to the other scores that were on the system at least. Next there was The Adventures of Willy Beamish, a dialogue choice based adventure game where you play as a juvenile delinquent named Willy Beamish and the goal appears to be to avoid getting shipped off to military school. Coming in last but certainly not least is Star Wars TIE Fighters Unfortunately, the game had some kind of copyright protection implemented, and I don't have the code to get past it. There's a ton more stuff on this system too, but I couldn't hope to cover it all in one video, so I think here's where I'm going to leave it. I hope you guys enjoyed this look at a great piece of computing history as much as I did. Stay tuned, because the next video I have coming up should be pretty awesome, but for now guys, thanks for watching, and I hope I'll see you next time.